baby boomers. I used to be with it. Millennials. Okay, boomer. Generation X. What's going on? And Gen Z. <laughs> what do they have in common? Not a lot, it turns out. But one thing they can agree on is that this is the political podcast they want to listen to. Welcome to Not My Generation, the political podcast that looks at political events, news and happenings across the world and at home through a generational lens. Your hosts are Dr. Emily Stacy and Professor James Davenport, two political scientists from Rose State College. But the views expressed on this program are solely the views of the host and their guests and do not reflect the views of Rose State College, its administration, faculty, or students. Coming up on today's program, get off my lawn. Many time Gen Xers can get together with millennials. I think good things can happen. Exactly. At the end of the day, citizens know best, right? Or if they don't, and they we, don't. Can, we can try again. And now, here are James and Emily. And we're back. This is James Davenport, along with my colleague, fantastic, wonderful, Dr. Emily Stacy. That's me, I think. How are you doing? I'm okay. It's a, another lovely Friday. And it is. We've got a special guest in the room. We have Representative Mickey Dollins sitting here with us, and we're going to be talking about quite a bit of stuff. Um, I'm going to try to get out of grumpy old man mode. I have been in that mode for like a couple of days now. and It's been a couple of years. It's called hey dis now, dissertating. Hey now, dissertating, you know, right? You have an, you've got a good excuse, sir. You know, I it's was hard. talking to some students the other day, and I said, I'm not an older Gen Xer, but that's not, depending on what year you say Gen X starts, I'm either at the tail end of the older group of them or I'm at the beginning of the middle group. Right. So, you're, you're mid mid. -ex. But what I realized is I'm not a young Gen Xer. And so I, I'm feeling that. So you're very and grumpy this week about this. Let me just tell you, if get off my lawn comes out of my mouth during this podcast, you'll know what's going on. Quite an epiphany you've had this week, uh, sir. It, it has not been a good one. Uh, clearly. <laughs> I am excited to, I, I will mention, since you're on the, the generational aspect of things, uh, you are outnumbered two to one by uh, some millennial yeah. uh, geniuses well, right here. It, so it, I'm not sure it's a fair fight. But Expect that's, greatness. You'll, you'll, you'll do the best you can, I'm sure. Oh, yes. so. <laughs> Indeed. Before we get started in, in terms of our guest, uh, we did want to make mention of a couple of things. Number one, uh, since we have last broadcast, uh, we are in the second week, going into the second week, or kind of in the middle of the second week, I suppose, it's Friday, mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, conflict in Gaza uh, between the Israelis and Palestinians. And I, it's important. I've been, of course, uh, doing a lot of current That's events true. this week, a lot of uh, a lot of stringing the threads together and how this ties to Russia, how it ties to Iran, uh, how if I were Xi Jinping, I would be salivating uh, at the fact that the United States States is now concerned with two war fronts. Um, this is this is not great stuff. Um, no, as we, it is not. <laughs> as we move uh, towards, uh, you know, the international community, the you know, the presidential election in twenty twenty four, right? Leader of the free world. Um, things are really hectic and un uncertain, and I am uh, I'm not hopeful. At the well, moment. there there has been, and then there looks like there's going to be even more human carnage yeah. in that area of the world, and. Right. Uh, and it's a tragedy uh, that that we're in that situation. Uh, you and I have been discussing, just just for our listeners will know, uh, perhaps doing another one of our live town halls specifically on that topic. I think uh, we do. I think that would. Um, uh, we did one of those when the Ukraine war broke out. Uh, I think this is certainly one that that merits that kind of attention. I as agree. Well. I agree. And and, uh, and so we'll be looking forward to that. Yes. Exactly. I will get off my soapbox about it, but uh, it's it's one that is a, a really important uh, international issue to understand and to understand in a full context. Uh, and I don't know that the American media does a, a good enough job uh, of presenting the full historical context. Um, so we would like to do that. That's where political science fills in That's those what gaps. We're for. So look forward to that. Uh, and then one other thing I wanted to mention because it's delicious, podcasters. Uh, and again, right, Dr. Stacy is still correct. You still don't have a Speaker of the House. In fact, you are in the now third vote uh, of Representative Jim Jordan, who apparently uh, has been told unequivocally by these uh, eight holdout Republicans that he's not ever going to be Speaker. Um, so I'm not really sure what we're doing um, besides spinning uh, our man, wheels. I'm telling you, I... Uh, 
somebody's going to have to be willing to uh, reach across the aisle yeah. and say, if we offer up this candidate, can we get some votes and get a speaker, right? right. Uh, and uh, that's going to be interesting to see who could do that and under what conditions, because you know Democrats are going to do that and just say, sure, and not right. expect something no. in return, exactly. right? And so that's going to be the question. Right. So the the interesting part about this is the they actually, the Republican caucus had a meeting yesterday uh, where they queried uh, whether or not they should empower, right, uh, the interim speaker, McHenry, and right. that was scrapped uh, in that meeting. And I don't, I mean, Democrats would have been foolish to go along with that anyway, right? It would have just been uh, giving Jordan another, you know, couple of days to mm-hmm. kind of whip support, uh, but it seems like even with enough time uh, that he is not going to get through. The interesting part about this third vote that's going on right now uh, is that there are only 200 and, uh, uh, what did they say, 220 four people on the floor. Um, so you've got kind of a, yeah, you've got a reduced count, um, which could benefit Jordan, but it could also benefit uh, Hakeem Jeffries. Uh, so wouldn't it just be like the the irony of all ironies uh, if coming out of this, you know, you end up with a Democratic speaker. I don't think it's going to happen, but man, man. You've got to think, <laughs> somebody up there is like, we've got to get out of this Where's mess. Where's Tom Cole? Uh, you know, Tom Cole said, I'm not, I'm not trying to be speaker. I don't want to, but at some point, somebody's got to do it. Just wrangle can, people. Yeah. I mean, I don't, he doesn't need to run for speaker, but somebody needs to wrangle these folks. Uh, so very quickly, uh, in conjunction to this, right, because again, without McHenry really having the empowerment, he's just kind of sitting there, right? Um, because it's not really clearly delineated what he's what he can there do is what authorized he can't to do, do right? right? That's right. Um, so the White House just this morning uh, asked Congress for a $100 billion uh, emergency national security funding package. So $61.4 billion for Ukraine, $14.3 uh, for Israel, $14.4 billion uh, for the southern border, $2 billion for the Indo-Pacific, which again, hi, Taiwan, uh, and then $10 billion for humanitarian aid, uh, which would be distributed apparently between Israel, Gaza, Ukraine, and the border. So. I mean, we're Who's making requests. How's that going to happen? Exactly. Right? Who's going to move that? Yep. So interesting stuff going on internationally, domestically, and it all ties together. Never because that's what a dull moment. Is. And we're going to be talking about some not dull moments yes. here in Oklahoma as well, right? We have Representative Dollins with us. We're going to be talking about initiative petitions. Here's Dr. Stacy's real question that she doesn't want to really ask, but I'm going to ask. Why do Republicans hate democracy? Mm, I asked myself uh, that. How's that? I know. I know. I Only Nixon can go to wow. China. And so, you know. Only Nixon <laughs> can go to China. Wow. That's an interesting way of putting it. But it does beg the question that the party of limited government and local control has become the party of intrusion, control, and punishment. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I am happy to be here today on the podcast, and I'm I'm happy to represent the millennials. And anytime Gen Xers can get together with millennials, I think good things can happen. Right. It's funny how my algorithms on social media have started pushing nostalgic, like '90s flashbacks <laughs> to me. It's so strange. Like I'm looking at McDonald's toys from the '90s, and I'm like, wait, I think I've got a box of those in storage. Like, what is going on here? But it must be around the holidays when they start pushing the nostalgia. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you've got Oklahoma. We're in a uh, supermajority Republican state. That's correct. Yet at the same time recently, we've passed some of the most progressive laws thanks to direct democracy, the citizen-led ballot initiative. If it weren't for that, we wouldn't have Medicaid expansion. We're now more than 260,000 people have health insurance who otherwise wouldn't. Wouldn't have medical marijuana that has put in tens of millions of dollars into our state coffers. It's one reason why we have $4 billion surplus. When I came in, we were $1.5 billion in the hole. Yeah. And we've got criminal justice reform. And you got a lot of other really great ideas that people are passionate about that they want to put on the ballot, whether that's reproductive access or ending gerrymandering, letting municipalities raise their local minimum wage. All of these ideas that have bipartisan support amongst constituents will never be addressed in the legislature And that's what the beauty of the direct democracy is, and it's why it was instilled. You know, Oklahoma is the only state in the country to have that originally put in our state constitution in 1907. Mm -hmm. 
And it was put there as a check and balance on an out of control legislature that refuses to listen to the people. So now they've got this tool in their democracy toolbox that allows them to affect change. Unfortunately, it's being attacked. That process is being attacked, not just in Oklahoma, but in many uh, GOP controlled states around the country. And it's been a passion of mine as a member of the Elections and Ethics Committee to to stand up and fight for those uh, for that tool that the people have to affect change. So let's talk about that, uh, the, the process first. So people understand I teach this in uh, my American government classes uh, that that at the state level, and at the local level, we have some aspects of direct democracy that you don't have at the national level. Right. The initiative petition, the referendum, these kinds of things. Um, but what's the process? Let's say I have an idea. I can't get the legislature to act on it. Mm-hmm. The idea I use with my students all the time, which they love, is let's say I don't think there should be homework assigned over the weekends and there ought to be a law against that. But for some reason, I can't get my legislator Mm -hmm. to file that bill. Right. So I'm going to start an initiative petition. So what's the process for getting that going? That's a great question. And there is a framework around the process. I think that we should also before we get into the process, we should define some and, and address some talking points that we've heard from the far right recently Mm -hmm. in that America is not a democracy, we are a republic. And that has to be addressed in that we are a democracy and that we elect people to go make decisions on our behalf. And we are a constitutional republic in which those elected representatives representatives have to adhere to. And so I I say just because I'm an Oklahoman, it also makes me an American. Mm -hmm. And and Mm -hmm. so while a democracy is a, a constitutional republic is just a form of democracy. So anyone listening, you're sure to hear that pretty soon. Have, oh, has that I, come up? I, I hear that all the time. We are, I like to tell, we are a democratic republic. republic exactly. Right? The That's answer is yes. We are, we are both. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and yes, but there has always been a presumption that there would be more democratic action at state and local levels than at the national level, right? Because it's easier to implement. Uh, there's Those levels are closer to the people that they represent. Uh, and so that aspect of that more democratic activity at the state and local level has always been a part of our history. Uh, sometimes used for good, sometimes used for bad. Exactly, right. But it's always been there. And so uh, I think that's interesting Yes, I hear that all the time. Um, there was a time when I identified as a conservative, and I probably even said that. Uh, but the reality is we have a, a framework which limits the ability of the majority to do certain things. But the decision-making process that we use in almost every aspect is a democratic process, right? If you get the most votes, you get what you want. And that has always been been the thing. And I really, really resent people who want to change the rules simply for the fact that the rules aren't benefiting them at that, at that particular yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. And, and, and so I, I, this kind of falls into that kind of category. Yes, for it me, does. Right? Absolutely. Right. You know, only 26 states have a form of direct democracy, mm-hmm. whether that be initiative petitions, election recalls or veto referendums. Yeah. And thankfully in Oklahoma, we have two of those. We have the veto referendum and the initiative petition. And being having that power as being one of the 26, it's really important that we protect it. I just had an um, interim study oh, a few weeks ago, and I would say a better term for that would be an interim presentation because there's not like a longitudinal <laughs> right. study. It's a day, yeah. maybe a couple hours. We, ha- we have the opportunity to bring in leading experts sure. from around the country to uh, speak on particular issues. And I was interested in looking at our process compared to other states. For example, we have a limited window of 90 days for petitioners to gather signatures based on if they're wanting to make a statutory change or a constitutional change. That is one of the smallest windows from any state in the entire country that has that power of direct democracy. Uh, Mostly the average is 180 days. States like Ohio, they just had a very big vote. Uh, They have, it's evergreen. They can take as long as they want to go and collect signatures. And so we we first broke down the process, and I'll get to your question in just a moment. And then we looked at possible reforms that we'll get to to enhance and strengthen the process of direct democracy and, and keep out of state influence, out of country influence from, from having too much say in how these go. And a really interesting case is, is 820, the recreational marijuana compared to state question 788 and the... Um, differences in the grassroots involvement mm-hmm. behind each yeah. made a huge, made yeah, a huge difference. Absolutely. 
We also heard some concerns, um, one being that rural Oklahoma doesn't get enough representation in, in these, um, you know, getting a, a state question on the ballot, to which I say, that's re- easily remedied. We have to simply open that window from 90 days to 180, at least 180, and that would give petitioners the opportunity to go to rural Oklahoma to talk to those folks that are there are fewer out there, mm-hmm. but they would be so pressed on time to where they're obligated and have to be in those parts of the state where most people are, like Tulsa and Oklahoma right. City and the suburbs. Saturated, yeah. And it's just got such a limited window. And and also, it also cuts down on out um, outside spending. Uh, because when you have the ability to get a grassroots movement going, you're less inclined to take finances from special interests because you've got to get a message out there. And TV, radio, and digital ads are expensive. But when you have a bit more time, you're less reliant on that. So getting back to your question, if anyone who's listening, if they have an idea and they first need to go talk to their elected officials, maybe that's at the municipal level, could be at the state level, um, not so much at the federal level. We've never had a national vote for a, uh, a, a national question, you right, could yeah. say, unlike, you know, Brexit, that was a national question. Canada has national ballot qu- uh, questions like that. But we don't have that. And that was one of the things that the framer said is that um, at that time, it wasn't even within states' rights. The ballot initiative became more popular as westward expansion went out. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and so you'll see it primarily on the West Coast states. Uh, but essentially, if someone has an idea, let's take... Um, restoring, I'll I'll use this example of uh, Desmond Mead from Florida. He's one of the gentlemen I interviewed for a book that I wrote called The Direct Democracy Blueprint that's going to come out in about a month. And uh, Desmond Mead is from Florida. And when he was younger, he made some poor decisions and he ended up in jail. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was doing about a 15 year sentence uh, from 17 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he soon found the the prison library and he started reading every book that he could find on law. And he was good. Beha- he had great behavior. He, he would read, 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 read. And he got out in nine years on good behavior. He went and took the LSAT, was accepted into law school. He graduated, became a lawyer, very successful lawyer, but he could not vote in Florida at the time because mm-hmm. ex-felons had their right to vote taken away. Permanently, right? Permanently, even after they paid their debt to society. And so Desmond used his knowledge that he gained through reading and becoming a lawyer, and he organized a grassroots coalition to restore voting rights for ex-felons. And he did this through Florida's ballot initiative. And it was wildly successful. Um, He put tons of blood, sweat, and tears went into getting the signatures. It went to the ballot. The people of Florida decided to vote yes. If you've paid your debt to society, you, you were a felon, you should have your right to vote reinstated. And just like that, over two and a half million Floridians had their right to vote restored. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the Republican-controlled legislature said, wait a minute, if you owe even one cent Mm -hmm. in restitution, Mm -hmm. in court fees, in any type of debt, then you still can't vote, which is constitutionally uh, (laughs) dubious anyway. And so some celebrities uh, heard about this, Mm -hmm. some professional uh, musicians, actors, athletes, and just people who wanted, you know, who support democracy in general, got together and collectively wiped out everyone's debt. And so Desmond Mead, a man who was learning law from his prison cell, uh, ultimately used his knowledge and his leadership to restore the voting rights for millions of Floridians. And that's the power of direct democracy. Well, and I think that speaks to something that I think our students, students in general, not just our students, but uh, oftentimes there's this notion that, well, I'm just one person. I can't call, I can't get anything done. And we have so many examples of one person who was passionate about something, who learned as much as they could about it and then took that knowledge and put it into action and changed the lives of many, many people. Uh, my one of my favorite stories it's a little bit different but favorite stories about this is the 27th amendment yes. here you have an amendment it was offered as part of the original bill of rights yeah. uh and it gets lost in the way it doesn't get ratified a graduate student at the university of texas mm-hmm. stumbles across it writes a paper gets like a c on the paper about hey i think this can get ratified mm-hmm. um And then goes out and does it, right? And all of a sudden you have the 27th Amendment. Uh, And by the way, the University of Texas retroactively changed his grade after that. I think that was like in the last decade or so, you know. Uh, but, But it goes to show that these kind of things do allow individuals 
to, to start movements that can impact the lives of millions and millions of people. And, and it's that direct democratic action. I can be involved. I can start something. I can make a difference. I don't have to wait on a legislator. I don't have to wait on the governor. I don't have to wait on somebody who's more experienced, knowledgeable, all of this. I can do it. Mm-hmm. Right. I have a question, sure. my my aged Republican, former Republican <laughs> friend. Um, right to work was an initiative petition, wasn't it? I believe it was, okay. yes, yeah. Right, so this yeah. is, um, right, so this yes. is kind of another example of the conservative party kind of taking, clawing back thing, uh, democracy that they once lauded, yeah. right, pushed out there. The, you know, and I can't speak for Republicans. I haven't been sure. in those circles I, in a I long didn't time. Mean I, no, no, I know, I know, you weren't. James Davenport is not the voice <laughs> of the conservative party. <laughs> I still have some, you know, some conservative leanings here sure. and there, but... Uh, and I'm not a populist by any stretch of the imagination. No, he is so, not. Uh, but um, yeah, I think you can go and look at any any party in which or a state where the one party dominates things, yeah. and that party is going to take action that to try to prevent things that they feel is harmful to their interest. And for whatever reason, Republicans have decided that. Uh, the way the initiative petition works, at least it seems to me, there's at least a body of Republicans. I don't want to speak, again, I don't want to speak for all of them, but there's a body of them that thinks that the initiative petition process is harmful to their interests. And so they're going to want to restrict it. But not just the initiative, right? Because at at a national level, this is a wider trend, right? Limiting early voting, uh, you know, the reducing the number of ballot boxes, mail-in ballot boxes that are available, et cetera. It's... And in Oklahoma, at the very least, these were conservative initiatives, right? Early voting. Early voting. I mean, all, uh, we've had early voting balloting. and absentee so, balloting I mean, for a long time. This is, this is a new flavor. This is the new flavor of conservative. This I, is it, not. It is. It's not. What it's not your Gen here. X version of conservatism. Oh, I'm just saying. I just didn't mean to set that it's up. It's not what yeah. we grew up thinking. Uh, and I, I know this because I regularly speak to uh, a group of uh, young conservatives and I am nowhere near where they are today, no, right? right. The, the, the position has moved dramatically. Yes, it has. Uh, and what I would have considered conservative in the 80s and 90s now is considered moderate yes. or uh, even, even liberal by today's conservative right. standards of some of these young people. And so uh, it certainly has shifted uh, quite a bit. Uh, and since Republicans, you know, our students are so young, they don't realize that pre-2000, yeah. um, Democrats were the supermajority in this state, sure. right? They don't remember that. Right. Uh, um, and uh, and so since Republicans gained a majority and became supermajority status, mm-hmm. uh, I think they suffer from some of the same things that Democrats, when they had the supermajority, suffered as well. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think that's, that's just the nature of political parties sure. and and having almost all power under your umbrella. Sure, I um, we understand and, that, but this is a different this is, flavor this, this is of a different that. flavor. This is more of a, a populist yeah. conservative movement as opposed to what I knew growing up, right? It, it very much is. Okay. And yeah, to bring that home, the exact things that you're talking about were introduced as legislation last year and they'll be brought up again. So Five bills were introduced in the Oklahoma State Legislature to dismantle or make it more difficult for people to utilize that ballot initiative process. Mm -hmm. Uh, The ones that I saw come through the Elections and Ethics Committee was raising the winning threshold from a simple majority, which is 50% plus one, to 60%. Mm -hmm. There was another bill that would have raised it to 66%. Mm -hmm. There was a couple of others. One had a $750 filing fee, which is, you know, when when you're wanting to get a question on the ballot, you go through the Secretary of State, you write up a gist, and then you have a title, b- ballot title later, and you go through the, the process of them being approved to go collect signatures, which I'll get to those thresholds in a minute. But to even have the um, opportunity to try, they wanted to put a $750 fee on it, which excludes a lot. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, running a state question is expensive. But to get that ball rolling like a Desmond Mead, you know, or the lady in Michigan, uh, Katie Healy, who put out a Facebook post and said, you know, I don't think politicians should be choosing their voters. Voters should be choosing their politicians. Let's end gerrymandering. Her 
uh, Facebook post went viral yep. and you know, she didn't have to pay $750 to get her idea rolling. Right. Another thing we saw was geographical distributions where they're saying that a vote in the panhandle means more than the vote in yep. Oklahoma city. Mm -hmm. And it was requiring that all 77 counties have a, you know, a, a, a threshold in order for it to get on the ballot or each congressional district had to approve you know, get so many signatures in each congressional district or effectively one congressional district can tank it for the entire state. Mm -hmm. So all these little things that make the process more difficult and it's just unnecessary is all about wanting to exert their agenda, have control over the whole process and take away the people's power sure. to get something done. And I'm going to make, uh, so this is probably going to be one area of this that I might, uh, there might be some disagreement on. But I certainly think for uh, uh, initiative petitions that are just statutory changes, the majority, just like a majority in the legislature can get that done, a majority vote of the people could get that done. I, I don't see why that needs to be changed. Where I might be persuaded is if you're making a change to the state constitution, I'm not sure a simple majority is sufficient, but that's what we've had. I mean, right? I mean, that's what we've had so far is, yeah. is a simple majority vote can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't allow that. So at the local level for, like, say, school bond measures, right. they have to get 60 percent, mm -hmm. right? Uh, at the national level to have a constitutional amendment, it's not a simple majority. Uh, so uh, I think a case can be made, a logical, rational case can be made that if you're changing the state constitution, maybe 51 percent isn't sufficient for that kind of change. Um, that might be the only variation that I might have with, with with what you're talking about here. But for statutory changes, which most of the time, that's what we're dealing with, right? We're not dealing with constitutional amendments. I know the Medicaid one was, right? So that amended the state constitution. Uh, uh, but uh, the medical marijuana was not, right. Uh, right to work was not, those types of things. And so... Making hunting the official sport of Oklahoma. Right. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, whatever. I, you know. I have trauma from my time in the legislature. Sorry. I think you make a, a good point there. But the way I'd push back on that is that the, the process of getting a constitutional amendment on mm -hmm. the ballot is so extremely difficult that I still think it should be only a 50% plus now, the one. The thresholds are higher, I guess, for okay. the signature thresholds. Is that correct? A constitutional amendment, like you mentioned, Medicaid expansion requires 15% of the total votes cast in the last gubernatorial election. Right. A statutory amendment like state question 788 medical marijuana requires 8% of the total okay. votes cast in the last gubernatorial election. So right. you're talking Double, tens of almost thousands double. of more signatures. Right. So for Medicaid expansion, it's about 175,000 valid signatures. And I think that's a good point. Um, and I'm not sure which way is better. Um, obviously, having that higher threshold is going to make it more challenging to get it done to begin with. And I'll tell you a big challenge, too, is in the state legislature. If we want to cut taxes, it's only required a simple majority, 51 percent. But to raise a tax, to get us out of the hellhole that we were in back in 2018, when we were one and a half billion dollars in the hole and you have a bunch of Republicans who have signed the Grover Norquist pledge mm -hmm. of promising not to raise one penny in tax and and then add that to requiring two thirds of the legislature, right. 78 right. votes to get us out of the hole. I mean, that was so incredibly difficult. And then just six years later, you have a governor who wasn't even around or I don't think had voted for a governor up to that point who wants to cut take away all of the hard work we put in to get the state mm -hmm. government back on track to actually somewhat fund core services, even though we're still bottom 10. It's just unbelievable. And that may be, that's something wrong with it. I don't like about term limits because when I'm talking about this on the floor, I look around and less, I think less than half the people still in that chamber were around in 2018 mm -hmm. when we had to make those tough votes. But Fortunately, it's they're thinking, well, by the time this all crashes, I'll be termed out and it'll be the next legislature's <laughs> problem. And it's just sad because like for me, I've got young children and I want them to be able to have the most opportunity to reach their fullest potential mm -hmm. in the public schools that they go to. And it's not about winning a campaign or a, getting brownie points on your conservative scorecard. It's about the future of the state. Well, and I, I if I remember right, that change... Uh, requiring the, the two-thirds threshold. Oh, that's actually 75%, isn't it? 75% of the legislature has to approve a tax increase. Is that correct? Two-thirds. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so um, uh, that was a change to the state constitution, yes? Yeah. That was, I right. believe, through a ballot initiative. Through yeah. a ballot initiative, yeah. correct? Yeah. So 
Uh, so we have seen yeah. that conservatives, liberals, everybody in between have yeah. used this process yeah. to accomplish certain things that they want to. And we can argue about whether we think we think that's good or bad, uh, what was accomplished, but they've all used this process yeah. at one point in time or the other. And right? that is a criticism. It's um, what would you do, for example, if they had the ballot initiative in Mississippi back during the civil rights movement? We mm -hmm. think we know how that would go. But mm -hmm. that's why we have a federal constitution to protect the basic human rights of, of yeah. people. So yeah. actually the people of Oklahoma in the early 2000s used the ballot initiative to outlaw gay marriage. Right. Yeah. And that that's was right. the law until the federal, you know, until the Supreme Court uh, said that's a and right. And it was, uh, was it 2010 also? It was sometime in that time that they also passed a law uh, through the ballot initiative uh, prohibiting state courts from uh, using Sharia law and yeah. making any decisions. Yes. That got struck down by the federal courts as well. Uh, so, so we've, we've seen it used yeah. Yeah. in different ways, but everybody's had an equal chance to use it. We have right. that checks and balance. Yeah. Right. And an interesting one was and when I got elected in 2016, so I'm going in my eighth year now, but uh, there was a state question on the, you know, that was presented to the people on whether or not state funds should be used to fund religious activities. Mm -hmm. For example, the 10 commandments at the state ca capital right. and the people of Oklahoma overwhelmingly voted and no, you should not, the government should not be allowed to use our tax dollars to fund religious activities. Mm -hmm. And of course, now we, we see the Republican controlled legislature still being defiant to the will of the people. And we just actually passed the first um, state funded private charter school. Right. Yeah, that's going to be, uh, I'm going to be really interested to see how that plays out because yeah. that's going to end up in the courts somewhere. Yeah, oh, yeah, already. Uh, and I think that's the case uh, that makes Drummond uh, governor. I've made no bones about this. I am absolutely an advocate of school choice, but I have a real issue with state direct funding of religious schools, yeah. right? Uh, I have uh, uh, to that direct amount, right, where we're just going to treat it like any other public right. school and send direct funding. Um but yet uh, we're not going to have any kind of public school restrictions on that environment. I, I have a little heartburn about, I have a lot of heartburn about that. You get to turn uh, down kids. You don't I'm, have to accept kids with disabilities. Uh, so uh, there's, there's some concern on that end. I, I certainly agree with, uh, even though I am and have always been an advocate of school choice, I'm not an advocate of blending state and, and, yeah. and religion at all that, creates a whole lot of problems that uh, I thought we had all learned we need to avoid. Apparently not. I mean, well, if the IRS recognized religions like the Church of Dudism or the Church of Bacon or the Flying Spaghetti Monster listening, I mean, here's your chance to start your own school. But uh, ultimately, I don't even think this is about one of the richest institutions in the history of the world creating an a actual online charter school because they could easily do they that. Could do that. Yeah. They could do that. This is just a vehicle to take this up to the federal yeah, yeah, Supreme right. Court right. and try to get an unprecedented ruling to um, open the floodgates, <laughs> so to say. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that's the main mission here. And, and you know, that it's been um, it's been a goal since Kennedy was elected because they wanted back when uh, mm -hmm. John Kennedy. Kennedy was elected. They, uh, Catholic archbishops wanted to use federal dollars or state dollars to fund religious activities. And he took a strong stance and said, no, we should keep them separate. Yeah. And ever since then, it's been ongoing. And here we are finally in 2023. And we could see a huge shift. Yeah. Very so it's good. that that whole question, I'm going to be fascinated to watch how that I plays agree. out. But there's no doubt that's going to be end of the course. And, and we'll yeah. see how that absolutely. How that plays out. As I mentioned, I think that may be one of the tells about uh, Drummond's future in the state. I'm telling you that man is coming for the governor. Well, he, he might be. He certainly might be. Um, uh, and it seems as though now, you know, he's got. Uh, a lot of support from, from support. different different yeah. areas, right? Yes. Uh, and um, I know there are some who who were not strong advocates of his, but um, uh, he um, you probably saw he recently came out and kind of chastised the Oklahoma Tax Commission yes. for some of the rules they were trying to implement on on the school choice mm -hmm. tax credit and how that would be played out. Uh, and so he came back and, and kind of said, "Hey, you're not." developing these rules yeah. consistent with the way the legislation was being written. So there's all sorts of stuff yeah. going on here, right? Oh, yeah. uh, that, that's happening that I think is very interesting. Um, all right. So 
I get this done. Now, if it's just a legislative statute that gets changed through the initiative petition process, the legislature can come back and treat that like any other law, right? They can modify it. They can change it. They could reverse it if they wanted to, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, we've seen that ongoing with medical marijuana Uh and changing that. But also I've seen an attempt from leadership, even on Republican side, to stick to the will of the people. But then every now and then you'll get some grifters in there that try to do something that will make no uh, it will make no difference except enrich them or someone that they know. Uh, but no, as a statutory change, the legislature can go in and change it. Um, of course, with Medicaid expansion, there are other things that come into play like managed care and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. Um, if we have time, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the reforms I think would be important. Yeah, that sounds great to me. Okay, so one of the big issues that people have with ballot initiatives are verified signatures. Yeah. Um, that has been one of the criticisms. And so this past um, year, the state hired a company to, quote, verify signatures. Mm -hmm. There was no bid process. There were just two people who applied for the job. It pays $300,000 a year, whether you do no ballot initiatives or whether you do one, two, or three. Mm -hmm. Uh, The person who got the bid had never done ballot initiative signature verification before. They're a Republican pollster, political consultant, They wrote the bill. They gave it to the speaker. The other one was from Arizona. They've been around since 2017. They have done multiple Mm -hmm. ballot initiative verifications from around the country. They were more expensive, but you knew what you were getting. You're getting what you thought you are, like what you're paying for. So they go with the cheaper option, the brand new, the acquaintance. As you remember, it took 46 days to verify these signatures from state question 820, Mm -hmm. which pushed it off to an arbitrary date. It missed the deadline needed for a big, I think it was either a primary or general election. They were not equipped. The Their scanners were not reading the paper. They were hiring temp workers, nothing against temp workers. But then also the uh, owner had to bring in his own family and they were hand counting these, these um, signatures. So that's a whole other issue on its own, right? Why was there no bid process? Why did they get the contract? But that really concerns me because we've seen that come up and be a problem in a lot of different areas over the last four or five years, right, of no bid contracts being awarded uh, with. And and I have a real issue with that just on the basis of I want the most efficient and most effective uh, expenditure of my tax dollar as possible. Uh, and if that means spending a little bit more up front but getting a better product in the end, mm-hmm. I'd much rather do that, right? Uh, so that's another topic for another day, I'm sure. But I, I'm sure you've seen that in, in, in some places. This seems to be something that has occurred way more regularly than I remember it occurring, you know, a decade ago or so. So, so with that 46 days that it took to verify the signatures, it didn't make the primary or general election. It got pushed off to an arbitrary date. Mm-hmm. As you know, a special election in Oklahoma cost taxpayers over a million dollars. So here you are having to pay a million dollars for a special election. You've paid a company that was unable to adequately do their job $300,000. So how do we prevent this? What can we do? What kind of reforms can we do to save taxpayer money Mm -hmm. and to give more stability or predictability to the petitioners who put all this work in gathering signatures? And my suggestion for that is that all state questions either go to a primary election or a general election. That way you have the most voter turnout. Mm -hmm. The decision will be most represented by the people of Oklahoma. And you're not spending over a million dollars for another special election. And then also, I think that now that Oklahoma accepts online voter registration, Mm -hmm. the power of a digital signature has just as much weight as a wet signature. We should allow petitioners to go into the community and collect digital signatures on their smartphones and tablets. And that way, they... um, the person signing will be their um, signature will be verified on the spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also I I think it's important that they are still out in the community because there's a lot of interaction that happens between someone signing and someone gathering signatures. There's questions and they can be, it can be signed up. And also you're, the person who's collecting signatures also has to sign an affidavit uh, and and have it notarized to um, swear that they had done nothing wrong or illegal. And so that part is still important, but there's no reason why, Petitioners shouldn't be able to go out and collect digital signatures. And then you're not having to deal with the boxes and boxes and crates of paper signatures. And I've talked, I've spoken to some people who have collected U-Haul trucks full of ballot papers. If that something were to happen to those papers, it's all gone. There's nothing to back it up. 
And so technology is our friend. That's right. Says the grumpy old yeah, man. Says the grumpy old man. That's right. So save money, yeah. have a better verification system. Mm-hmm. And make sure that more people show up so that the question whether it passes or fails yeah. is more reflective of the will of Oklahomans. Yeah, you don't, you know, vote for recreational marijuana on some random uh, Tuesday in March. Right. That's exactly what Ohio did with their vote to raise that threshold from 50 percent to 60 percent on yeah. the ballot initiative. Sure. They picked the arbitrary date mm-hmm. of August 8th. And one of the top yeah. leaders on the Republican Party said that they did this to create lower voter turnout. They said the quiet part out loud. Sure. And of course that went up in flames and the people decided not to vote away their power. Unbelievable. We know uh, that timing of these can affect the outcome, right? Uh, It can affect turnout. Uh, We've known that for a long time and we have seen in other measures they something similar with the marijuana uh, that uh, they they were trying to time this to where they would have what they thought would be a more favorable out, mm-hmm. outcome than, than what they wanted. Uh, it didn't end up working, but that so uh, that's a longstanding history of, of whoever's in power. If they don't want this to be forward, they're going to try to time it to where it disadvantages the, the proponents of it. Right. Right. The medical marijuana initiative, though, is kind of a, a more interesting story, I think, about the open and closed primaries uh-huh. in, in the state of Oklahoma, right? Sure. I will swear on, you know, this is my hill to die on, man. I, uh-huh. I write, you would not have medical marijuana in the state had the Democrats closed their primary back. Yeah, it would be interesting, right? It would be very, very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there seems to be more support behind open primaries yeah, than ranked choice voting. In Oklahoma, would you mind to speak a little bit about open primaries and your thoughts on it? I, um, I, I just think it is uh, at this point a detriment to the Republican Party in the state to uh, keep their primary closed. I, I can understand, you know, the purity aspect and argument of it, um, but as long as you have the other side that is open arms for those independents to come in and vote, um, I, I feel like it's a disservice. It's obviously not hurting their ter- uh, their registration, right? Which is exactly what I know you're about to say. It's not hurting their numbers. Um, uh, but I bet it is hurting turn overall turnout, I would bet. It, it could be. Um, yeah, I think as long as Republicans have more registered voters in the state than Democrats and independents combined, yeah. they're not going to see that it's harming them. Whether or not, I, I think you make a good case. It could be harming in turnout. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think they're all that concerned about not turnout at, all. at yeah. this at this point in right, time. No, of course not. For all uh, the things that Representative Don has just mentioned. I can, and I think Dr. Stacey and I are both big fans of ranked choice voting. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, I like that as a mechanism yeah. way more than I, and, and again, maybe this is my old man coming out. I just think if I'm a Democrat, I don't want Republicans choosing my nominee for me. Exactly. If I'm a Republican, I don't want Democrats choosing my nominee for me. But ranked choice voting, I think, is would would remove a lot of the extremes that we see from both sides. Now, in this state, we don't see a lot of extremes on one side because they're so small compared, uh, at least legislatively, yeah. right? Uh, uh, but uh, I still think you're going to start reducing the extremes and people are going to be voting more towards the middle through and that I hope process. So. Well, uh, we've got to get candidates but that are more towards the middle. There's a move, too, to try to block... Ranked choice voting in the state as it, well. They're right. going to introduce a bill to ban it at the municipal level right. across mm-hmm. the state. We can talk about that in a second. I want to go back to your comment, though. Do you th- not think that open primaries on the Republican side would also result in less polarity or less divisive primaries? Because uh, they'd have to. I don't know. I think you might people. see. Of course, we first thing we know is in primaries, it's the most committed people the who fervent. vote to begin yes, with. Yes, exactly. Right. That's fair. Um and I think you would only see open primaries in seats where one party didn't show up with a candidate, right? Uh, in those, you might see some some moderating trends, but I'm not sure how much. I mean, again, if you just look at registration numbers, yeah. it doesn't matter. Sure. Um, uh, and I, what you might end up doing is increasing, if Republicans think that Democrats are going to show up and vote in their primaries, you might actually increase turnout amongst Republican voters to, to maintain or even push to more an extreme level through an open primary process. I'm okay with that. I would love to see some, I actually need to see. I'm okay with tricking people to voting. <laughs> That's fine. I, I would like to see some research on this I, that, I that shows, right? Uh, the, uh, we're That's political right. scientists. I'm pontificating. We want to know, know what the data show. We want to know what, uh, what has been done. I think, I, if I remember correctly, there has been research showing that open primaries do tend to increase overall turnout. 
I think that is true. Uh, I just don't know which way that turnout here, goes. Yeah, yeah. agree. You mentioned if you look at overall voter turnout, I can see that being applicable at the state level. Uh-huh. But if you're going at the district level, like mm-hmm. house level, it can there's some that have like in mine. Mine was gerrymandered right. to be now more Democrat. Right. So I, I do think that it having open primaries on even on the Republican side in some House districts mm-hmm. would cause the Republican candidate to not be so extreme and to have to campaign to a broader base. It that's could. I, I think that that's a possibility. Yeah. Uh, I just I would like to see some real research showing showing that before I commit to saying that's, that's what the outcome would be. Right. That's fair. Yeah. Jump into ranked choice voting now. Yeah, I do think that we're going to see a bill to ban that, just like they banned local municipalities right. from raising their minimum and wage. And I'm not, uh, so I'm going to stay out of my grumpy old man lane. I'm, I'm going to try to stay out of that. Um, let's not go down. I don't want to turn this into a conversation about the minimum wage, but I am all for local units of government experimenting with all sorts of policies. I would love for a local unit of government somewhere around here to to experiment with a basic guaranteed income sure. and see what the results of that would be. Uh, so I think those types of things create knowledge of which we can make informed decisions mm-hmm. by preventing local units of government from experimenting with these things. We're cutting off knowledge from which we are unable to make the best decision yeah. possible. And so, uh, I have no issue, even if it's a policy I disagree with, if that local government wants to go there and the citizens in that local government are supportive of it, let them go and run it. I may think it's foolish. I may think it's going to have bad outcomes. But that's there just to deal with. Right. And and it produces knowledge for decision makers at your level to say, OK, what were the outcomes of this experiment? Why did it go that way? Uh, and I don't like cutting off pathways of knowledge. Right. And I think that's what these kind of laws do. Yeah, I agree. Right. Your local governments are supposed to be hubs of innovation. Right. That's where you're supposed right. to try to replicate those let, things at the them, higher level. Let them try all sorts of things. And uh, and I, I think we are hesitant not just in Oklahoma, as people in general, uh, to allow policy or experimentation. In other words, we think this is good. We have data that shows this might work. We think it will work. We want to try it. But if we try it and it fails, guess what? We're going to pay a political price rather than saying, hey, we wanted to see what would go on. And so uh, I would love to see more pilot programs of different types of innovations to be started. And I think local units of governments are great to run pilot programs through, right? Uh, but we don't we don't see that. So uh, I am not uh, again, I'm a 1980s, 1990s kind of conservative mentality. Uh, I think local control is a real thing and should be allowed, even if I disagree with what that local unit of government's doing. Right. I don't have to live there if I don't want to. Right. And if I don't want my local unit of government doing something, I can vote. I can get out and advocate. Uh, but that's what this is. That's what democracy is about. Exactly. At the end of the day, citizens yeah. know best, right? Or if they don't, and they we don't can we can always. try again. They don't always, but that's okay. Right. We, exactly. You don't learn if you don't try. Yep. Yeah, I think hopefully we can get to a point someday if it's not banned. I know at this point it would be impossible. Our voting machines are not up to date to be able to tabulate uh, ranked choice voting. However, in our interim study, Secretary Paul Zirex, he does a really good job at yes. running elections. That man's been there for a long time. He, yeah. he did say that our voting machines are due for an upgrade in the next five years. Yeah. And all of the new voting machines are being equipped to accommodate ranked choice voting, Excellent. which you mentioned a UBI. Uh, right. Alaska has a citizen dividend fund, That's which right. is all like a UBI. Right. And they're also one of the states that has implemented ranked choice voting across the state. And they really like it. And... Alaska's last I checked, kind of a red Predominantly state. Predominantly conservative, right? yeah. Right? Yeah. So uh, why can we not just say, let's figure this stuff out. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. Uh, I don't like the fear. I don't like fear mongering on any side. Uh, and it just seems to me that people are really afraid that, oh, well, if we allow this to happen, something bad, let's see what happens. Let these local units of government do their thing. We can take that information, make informed decisions. Uh, but but it's like the na- they get upset when the national government comes yeah. in and says, we're not going to let states do this. Mm-hmm. Oh, states rise. State rise. Why is it the same principle applied at the local level? Yeah. I, it should be. I agree. Right. Well, I think we have about ran out of time. This has been a great conversation. I hope you'll consider coming back and visiting with us again. Maybe maybe we can steal you during the legislative session and you can give us a, an update from your perspective on, on what's going on there. Hopefully sooner than that, I'd still like to touch on some issues like housing and uh, Oh, that is such a big issue. And, and uh, 
Uh, and I can, uh, we could certainly talk for uh, hours on housing alone. So love to have that conversation as well. We'll continue it. Yes. And if you are interested in uh, seeing Representative Dollins in person, he is going to be a speaker uh, at the Oklahoma Political Science Association Conference uh, on November 9th at the University of Central Oklahoma. Uh, so stay tuned for information about that as well. Fantastic. And uh, we are going to have some of, of my favorite political scientists on our, our next program. Favorite. Right? They're uh, going to hear that and, and think that some of our favorite political scientists on the show program next time. So tune in and find out what uh, what all of us political science nerds are talking about. We'll see you next time. Bye. We love communication that goes both ways, not just you listening to us pontificate. We would love to hear from our audience. If you have comments, suggestions, or would like to contact us about possibly being a guest on the show, please email notmygeneration at raider.rose.edu.